Everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Joey Evans. I'm Z Garcia. <clears throat> Today we're taking a look at a game called The Veil of Eternity. Ooh, um, Ooh that sounds mystic. So mysterious. Ooh. I gotta say, when it came in, I saw the box, I looked at it, I was like, oh, it looks nice, and then I immediately forgot about it. Yeah. I, the Veil of Eternity is not a very, uh, it doesn't grab you, that title. No. As a book, maybe. Maybe. No. But the Mondu games, I do like their stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. It's from Korea. And so I stuck it on the shelf and said, oh, I'll get around to playing it. And then I played it and played it some more and played it some more. Not spoiling at all, but let's see how it plays first. Okay. The game's going to be played over 10 rounds, and at the end of those 10 rounds, whoever has the most victory points is going to be the winner. We are taking a look at a game with three players here. We have a star player token, and we have a shuffled deck of cards as well as these over here. So every round is going to have three parts, each one of those 10 rounds. We are going to do a hunting phase, we are going to do an action phase, and then a resolution phase. So the first one, the hunting phase, we've got a deck of shuffled cards here. We are going to draw a number of these cards equal to the number of players times two. So in this case, like I said, three players, six cards. We are going to reveal all these and place them around this wheel here so that they are in the corresponding color. So for example, these three would end up right here under this color banner to denote that they are that color. We've got one of these and we've got two of those. That's it, that's all we got. If any of them had been that symbol, they would show up there and the green one sh would show up right there, all right? Now, starting from the start player, we are going to take turns going around the table, claiming one of these cards by putting our token on it. Uh, and then uh, after the last player has claimed one, we are going to do it in reverse order again. So the last player will claim one and then immediately claim another. And this player will claim uh, this one and I will then take the last one. And that is it for the hunting phase. Then we go into the action phase from the star player. I'm going to do all of my actions now. And my actions are a few different things. So there's some things I can do with these cards out here. I can either sell a card or I could tame that creature. So if I sell a card, I'm going to pick one of mine and I'm going to sell it for the value listed in the line above it right here. And those you can see come in these denominations, the sixes, the threes, and the ones. Now the trick is I can only ever have four tokens. It doesn't matter where the values are, but I can only have four. So for example, if I sell one of these, it's four of these ones, but that's capacity for me. So uh, you have to be mindful of that. You can go above that, but then you immediately discard. So you can only ever keep and effectively have four of these. So perhaps I remove my token and I sell this one. I discard the card and I get one of these tokens. Second option of my turn is I could tame one of these. So I could, again, pull back my token and put this in my hand and I have tamed it. I can also summon a card, put it out on the table, pay for it, and if I overpay, I don't get any change, and then it comes uh, onto the uh, table for me and I will have that card. It might have an, an immediate effect, it might have a recurring effect. Um, or one that happens when the end of round scoring uh, comes around, all right? So that's another option, I could do that. I'm simply going to tame this one, but I don't wanna pay for it right now because I've been wasting a lot of this money. So I'm going to keep it in my hand, and then uh, you do have to be mindful that the number of cards in front of you, the maximum number of cards you can have, is equal to the round we're currently in. And so very early on it might not be a problem, but you do have to be mindful, right? So right now I could only have one card in front of me and they cannot be removed freely. In fact, that's your fourth and final option on your turn, is you can pay to remove a card to make room for a new card in front of you. The cost to remove one is equal to the round we are currently in. So if we're up to the fifth round, and I really need to play a different fifth card and have to remove a previous one, I need to pay five. You know, I could, I could overpay with something like this. So there you go, be aware of that. All right, so I'm done, and then the next player would go, right? And the next player would perhaps, uh, let's see, they might uh, sell this one for a six as well, and then maybe they will tame and and deploy that one there, right? They're going to uh, summon it. 
And so this one's on the table, it immediately says, immediate effect, earn two of these. So they have two of those. And then it has an ongoing ability that says the values of your threes and sixes are each increased by one. Wonderful. So they have a card in front of them. The next and final player over here would go. They are going to, um, they are going to, let's say, at the beginning of the game, of course, we are looking to get some money. So perhaps they will once again uh, sell that one, tame uh, this one, and bring it into play, perhaps. Or they could keep it, right? And so this one here has an, uh, an ability, uh, it costs four, by the way, That's they paid the six for that. And it says, earn one victory point for each pink card in your area, immediately recover this card. So they play this, they immediately earn one point for each pink card, they only have one. And then immediately recover means this immediately comes back into your hand. So this player has this as a tamed card in their hand. Once we are done with that, we are going to then do a, a third and final phase for the turn, which is uh, going to be all about scoring cards on the table in front of you. So this is what they call a resolution phase, and it is going to have to do with these symbols that have the hourglass on them. So this is going to happen ten times in the game after we've drafted cards and sold or, or tamed or played them out, summoned them. We are going to check everyone's area for these hourglass symbols, and they all happen in the order of your choice. So if I had this in front of me, for example, I'm going to earn one of these threes, and that happens every round, at the end of every round, as long as this is in front of me. So it's all about finding these combinations and making things work for you, uh, where the, the root of the problem and the interest in the game is going to come in. So there you go, having done all of that, obviously I don't have this card, we go to the second round, we are going to put out some new cards, six new cards, we draft them, uh, we are going to then take turns uh, utilizing those cards, utilizing our, our uh, mana here, don't forget you can only have four of these no matter the kinds, uh, and then doing a phase of scoring and going on to the next round. At the end of all ten of those rounds, whoever has the most victory points is of course the winner of the game. I think in this game, the, the money system Real is brilliant. It works. It shouldn't work. Like when I first heard about it, I was like, I don't know, only four? You don't get change? It's a really neat, it's fully <laughs> mechanical, right? I mean, right. there's no thematic reason for this. That's true. But it is so... You're summoning, taming. Yeah, it's right. really cool, this idea of you can only have four pieces of yes. currency. A six takes up the same space as a one, you know what I mean? And then the different locations, like one of them gives you four ones. Yeah, that's good, but I know. Also, it takes you to capacity. You'll be throwing some of that away, likely. So that's really clever. <laughs> I agree that that's probably that right there. It's probably my favorite part of this game because of how interesting that is. I agree because there's so many different little nuances in that. Like I had one car that would make every one a three. I'm like, this. I'm going to win now because now. But now all of a sudden, I wasn't taking sixes. Because I can get ones in there, and it was just that give and take of only four stones. That's that's huge. Mm -hmm. And which ones to get? And the things play with that, right? <coughs> like the first time I played, very early on, like I got the card that said you can have six stones in front of you. I was like, yeah, <gasps> unbeatable thing. I will now win the game, and I have to. Do, well, I was like, I'm still only keeping four many times, so maybe it was not as good as I thought. But then another game, I was like, oh, I wish I had that. Mm -hmm. It yeah. just depends. Yeah. So the game is combolicious. There's 70 cards, uh, which, as a side note, I think is a little too few, um, if only because you have to shuffle in four players. And I would prefer not to right. shuffle. It's one of those games where I think it'd be better just to go through the deck as is. There's 70 cards. Every card mm. is different. <clears throat> Some are similar, but they're very different. The families have a different feel to them, but... I just love trying to build this cool combo and also trying not to let someone else build a cool combo. If he has something that turns his threes into sixes and then right. gives him an extra three every turn, I see a card come out. I don't want to give that to you. Right. So I'll take it and I won't even use it. I'll throw it away for money. That's the biggest thing. Hey, drafting's really big in this. It's a real thing in this game. Yeah. You, you will feel it. Um, and my biggest, I just talked about the, the coolest thing in the game. I think my biggest negative then would be 
yes, it's very prone to hate drafting, to mm -hmm. taking a card because I know you want it, even though I'm just throwing it away. And then there's a few cards that are directly nasty in this game, which felt a little out right. of place to me, to be honest. I thought it was... And I get that this is sort of trading card game adjacent. It has that feeling. But when there's a little sprinkling of nastiness like that, direct, like, get rid of that card. Boom. It, it feels out of place. If it's part of the game's DNA, you sort of accept it. In this one, I thought it felt a little shoehorned in. Those didn't bother me as much. I don't normally like that sort of thing until I realized the cards you're getting rid of are usually just a... Yes, it could be part of your little engine you've built, but the things that give you the most points are the single shot cards mm -hmm. Right when you play right. them down. So yes, I could kill his, oh, turn his threes into sixes, and that's a big deal, but it's not unsurmountable. It just sure. takes that away briefly, and it frees up a slot in front of you. I mean, there's a card, one of the cards in the game says, kill three of your own cards. I'm like, why would you ever do that? But it's to free of the slots up so you can play sure. more, which is sure. kind of interesting. Yeah, and the, also the engine building in it makes it to where you're focusing on yours, but the turns could get a bit longer later in the game because there's a lot that can go on as you process each card. You know, it'll go back to your hand, it'll come back out, and, and you look over, you're like, how did you just get that much? But it, it is, that, that's the fun of the game, you know? If you're there three quarters of the way through and you realize I have not done it correctly, that's happened a lot. But it's a quick game, so that's why I enjoy that engine building aspect of it. I think it's interesting. That that idea of the turn you're on is how many cards may be out. Yes. That's a clever concept. Mm -hmm. It's a game that's going to naturally ramp up. And you can fall behind that curve and still be fine, which I also like. It's not that you need to, oh, it's round six. I better have six <laughs> cards out or I'm doing badly. No, I played, the last game I played, I was definitely trailing everyone else in the number of cards everyone had on the table. They were sort of keeping up. And I had fewer. I had a few cards that bounced back into my hand, things right. like that. But I was keeping up points-wise. I was doing fine. And I I think that's cool. Both of those things together. The claiming a card and then throwing it away for money and having a limit there or taming it. And the limitations of how many you may have in front of you. That's the beauty of these kinds of games is those limitations and working within them. This one threads that needle really, really well. You do not feel like you're choking, like the game's not letting you play, but you also don't feel like you look at your hand of cards and go, I don't know what to do. I got too many options. I'm locking up here. You right. know? They're out there. <laughs> You're looking at whatever, six, eight cards, depending on the number of players. Draft them. Chuck it for money. Take it into your hand and then, oh yeah, I'm going to play that guy. I really like that flow. It's a good flow. And I like how at the beginning, you can get rid of a card by paying the value. And you're like, why would you ever do that? Then later you realize some of those cards are no longer as powerful depending on the engine you have. Yeah, you can get rid of it by paying the, the, the round you're on in right. money. And it's like... And you're like, do I do it now or do I pay more for it next? I don't need that space now, but I don't want to... You pay more next round. Yeah. I like that mechanic too. Yeah, the game reminds me a little bit of Seasons in the way that the combos work. It's a game I enjoy. Um, but the, the the theme... Yeah. The theme is, yeah, it's sort of yeah, fantasy-esque. Uh, gotta catch them all or something. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not there. But it's one of my favorite uses of snake drafting. Because in this game, yes. I'm pretty happy. I'm like, I go first. Great. I get first pick of the cards. If you're like, you go last, I'm like, okay, cool, I, that's not great because I only get to pick the fourth card in a four-player game, but I'm then picking the fifth. Yes. And it's mm -hmm. easier to then say, here's what's left, I'll take this and this. Well, if you have the first card, you might take one and be like, I sure hope that one's there when it's not going to be. Sure, you know? right, yeah. So I don't mind it. This is also one of the games in which I don't mind when it comes back around to the first player that there is no choice. You get what's left. Right. I like that, too. I don't too. mind that in this game. No. You're going to get money, at least. Yeah, because you can be like, all right, well, that one, I don't care for that card. It's getting sold. I'm just taking the cash. It makes it a lot easier, the fact that you don't lose, you just get money. Yeah, you're not, I'm not getting a card I don't want. And then there's that balance of this more powerful card, but that may give them more money because it's in that spot. You're, you, you know, I like that, too. Mm -hmm. If you're a second to last person. All right, what would you rate it? Honestly, this is one that I think goes through that... I was surprised, did not expect a lot out of it. I really enjoyed this. I would give this an eight, honestly, because 
I think it's quick. The 40 minutes is, I think sometimes it's shorter than that, but it's a great engine building. It's got everything and that. The stones, again, like Z said, are what really have me gravitating towards this system. It's really, really a nice play. This is very much my kind of game. Cards with powers. You know, trading card game adjacent type mm -hmm. stuff, which is what this is. Um, it takes a little bit of a hit from me, again, for having a, a weirdly unnecessary mean streak, but it's not a, enough of a streak to be part of it, the game's... DNA. There's a few cards. And they just seem a little out of place. But that aside, I really, really like what's going on here. I think it's a great game. I'm giving it an 8.5 out of 10. Really, really solid game. Just fun to play. Mm -hmm. To draw cards, read what they do, play them out, trigger things. It's like a kid playing with a new toy. That's what that feels like. My biggest complaint is that it, I just, it feels like there's not enough. I feel like I ate half an ice cream sundae, and I want more. But I'm still, I, I love this. I'm giving it a nine. I really love this game. The only reason that, I mean, I, I, this is like, I'm with you on that. That whole card combo, cards are always useful. I sit there and think how this works with that, but at the same time, I don't have to look anything up, really. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to look through the rule book and say, how does this work? Yeah. It, they all make sense. There's not key, there, there's a, a few keywords occasionally, like the, what do we call it? Summoning and taming. Taming. Yeah. You know that. And there's like the one that returns to your hand, whatever that's called. Right. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And then it just, you, it, it's easy for me to teach. I like how it plays. I just, there's 70 cards. I want 140 or 150 or even 100. You know, I just, I want more. I'm hoping this game is popular enough to have an expansion because I will instantly get it. That's the only thing. But even with the 70 cards, it's so much fun. I've played it many times and every time they come out in a different order, a card you think is great early game actually turns out to be even better at late game or whatever. Just a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, there you go. That's The Veil of Eternity. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Joey Evans. I'm Z Garcia. And this is a dragon? or It's, it's a legally distinct Pokemon. Ah. <laughs>